Okay, here is video number four where we talk about the Arduino Uno and how it works. What is this thing that we keep talking about or I keep bringing up? Well, let's just dive in, shall we? The, uh, here's a couple different angles of the same uh, product. Uh, the Arduino is essentially a life support system for this chip right here. Uh, do you see it's backwards or it's upside down? It says Atmel. That's the name of the company that makes this microchip. And this particular one is called the AT Mega 328. And there's a whole family of microcontroller chips. Some are big, some are small. They, uh, there are a lot of different features that can be inside of them. Uh, some are expensive, some are very cheap. Uh, when I say expensive, like up to eight bucks or so each or something to that effect. But this uh, whole circuit board is a way is, is, is a way to keep this chip happy and running and give it all it needs to do its job. It also has some features to help interface with it <clears throat> a lot easier. Okay, so before we go on any further about the Arduino, we need to talk about this chip for a second. What is a microcontroller chip? What in the world does that mean? Here's a side view. You can see it actually plugs in. You can pull it out of the socket. That's because in case you break it because you forget to put a resistor in and, 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 you, and you, when, you're, when you're running a light or something and you, and you break the chip, you can swap out and put a new chip in really easily. Uh, all right, so let's see here. A microcontroller. Well, let's compare it to the microprocessor, something we may be a little bit more familiar with. If you've ever made your own computer before, it doesn't really seem to happen much these days, but that was kind of a popular thing to do not too long ago. You would uh, have to do uh, make a lot of decisions. First of all, you'd have to choose which microprocessor you wanted, and usually you had Intel or AMD. Uh, even there's a couple other uh, possibilities, but anyway, choose your processor. But as we know, the processor by itself can't really do anything. You need to get a motherboard, and then also you need to, uh, and the motherboard has to work with it. You need some memory to put on your computer, like, uh, and you need to choose how much memory and then how fast the memory goes and the quality of it. There's a lot of variety out there. Then a hard drive of some kind, of course, there's a lot of decision, decisions here as well, like uh, solid state or, or, you know, the old style spinning disk and how much space and uh, other things you want to put in there. Do you want to have USB ports, Ethernet ports, all those other things to attach to the processor? So all these different decisions you had to make. Uh, before you could even have the microprocessor do anything useful. It needed all these other pieces to kind of work with it. It needed a hard drive to store an operating system on. It needed memory to work when, it, when, you, when it's running a program. It needs like a space to take notes and write things down for to get come back to you later. That's what memory is for. So <clears throat> that's a microprocessor. Kind of useless by itself, but put these other things with it. Uh, it then becomes useful. And it's kind of nice because it's flexible. You can decide how much of each thing you want. There's a lot of uh, choices you can make to make it exactly what you need. A microcontroller, on the other hand, uh, takes a lot of those things and shoves it inside the chip. So here is a diagram I found somewhere that actually kind of, you can kind of think of the entire chip being, uh, this being inside of it. Uh, here's your CPU, which is kind of what the microprocessor was on the previous slide. However, you'll notice it has memory over here, some amount, of, not a lot, this is 8K, as opposed to, you know, the 2 gigs of RAM that you see in other, uh, in computers or phones even. Uh, sorry, this is, this, is, uh, this is more of like a hard drive, I should say. This is where you write your program to. When you write the program, it gets burned into here, and then when the, when the chip turns on, it starts running it. Here's your memory up here, which is even, in this diagram, a lot less than 8K, just 368 bytes, but... It's all changes depending on what kind of microcontroller you get. Uh, EEPROM is sort of like an area you can write to that the, the, the program's not in, but it's just like a, it's kind of like a hard drive where you can uh, put any data you want. Um, oops, I don't want to do that. Okay, so the other thing I want to point out is we have ports down here. Ports are collections of pins that you can control. Pins that can either be input or output and there's only a little bit of current that it can do 25 milliamps 25 thousandths of an amp so these are not designed to be a lot of current but they're enough to control something else that can then turn on and off a lot of current uh, there's an oscillator inside here that makes its own we'll talk about what that means in a second uh, it makes a clock source there's also serial communication which is kind of nice serial communication is, is an old technology from like the 50s and 60s where uh, it's an easy way to transfer a byte from one processor to another at a certain speed <coughs> modems if you have if you guys probably don't know modems but uh, back in the day they used to have modems that you know we use the audio of the phone line and you could hear that 
when it connected, it was sending bytes back and forth over serial uh, into an audio signal and back. Okay, so let's continue on here. Uh, here's the Arduino. Uh, again, I'm gonna, I've am gonna i highlighted this section of all the, the components on it. And by the way, this is a USB port. And this is a power port if you just have a wall adapter for, you know, plug plug the adapter into your wall power socket and then the other end is like a little barrel plug that plugs into here. So uh, the Arduino can be powered from either location. Uh, and now I want to show the next slide which is a schematic. This is the, uh, the official diagram or they call it a schematic uh, showing how this Arduino works which looks very complicated until you kind of break it down into its pieces. So. We're not going to get too heavily detailed, but I just want to show you where things are. I've circled or rectangled this little section up here. This has to do with that barrel plug adapter that we saw on the lower left where you can stick power into. Power can come in and go through a diode which protects if you plug in the if you get something that's reverse voltage, so the five volts instead of coming in this way is coming in the other way. Uh, this diode will block that from going any further. So as long as 5 volts is coming in, it'll go pass through <clears throat> and then go into this neat little chip here that takes whatever comes into it and makes five, 5 volts output because you may not actually put 5 volts into this barrel. You might put 12 volts. You might have an AC adapter that gives you 12 volts DC or 18 or 9. Uh, you can run this off of a 9 volt battery for example and then the 9 volts comes in here and then gets transformed by this what's called a regulator into 5 volts. So this is kind of a neat little magic box that takes what you know anything higher than 5 volts and creates 5 volts output. And then this 5 volts is used by the rest of the circuit to get the stuff done. So I'm going to back up. So that's what this slide is uh, all about. This chip here is the regulator. This is what takes in 5 volts in one pin, uh, sorry, uh, anything higher than 5 volts in one pin, and then outputs 5 volts to the rest of the circuit. Uh, and these are capacitors that help stabilize things. They're kind of like little mini batteries. So in case there's a little dip in voltage, this will fill in the dip so we can have a nice steady 5 volts. Okay, that's the power supply section. Uh, the next thing is the clock source. Now, this is a, uh, interesting. There's not much to it. There's just a clock, uh, something that makes a clock pulse. And what in the world is a clock source? Why do we need a clock source? Well, think of this little music box. If, as, if, when you turn the crank, this thing makes music, right? If you stop, it doesn't make music anymore. Or if you slow down, it plays the music slower. You can kind of think of a clock source to a microcontroller or anything, like a processor, uh, as you turning the crank on that processor. The faster the clock source is, they're just pulses. So the, the more pulses per second you give this thing or the processor, the faster the processor goes. You may have heard of overclocking, for example, making your computer run faster. Even your phone these days, you can uh, um, overclock your phone to go faster. That's just speeding up the number of pulses so that uh, per second so that your processor works a little harder. Now, the obvious negative there is it uses more power. It also generates more heat and it may not be designed to get rid of that extra heat, so you may have an issue, or maybe not. Maybe it'll work just fine. It's kind of the risk you take when you speed up the clock. Here's a slide that shows a clock pulse. It's just, this is a graph that measures the voltage of, the, in this case, the clock pin, and you can just see it just goes up to five volts, goes down to zero volts, up to five volts, down. That's it, that's all a clock source is, on, off, on, off. It's, uh, you could just be sitting there pressing a button that goes between five volts and zero volts, and, and you can actually run the processor at a very slow rate because your a human finger pressing a button is very slow compared to you know, the, the speed of a regular clock. Uh, there's actually two different clock sources shown here side by side. Uh, the yellow one you can see is half as fast as the blue one or the turquoise one. So the processor, if it was being fed the yellow one, would run at half speed. So that's it. That's It's essentially turning a crank. And so the uh, the processor, the AVR controller, uh, needs a clock source in order to run. And so that's what this thing does. This is a little oscillator circuit inside of here that makes a clock source for it. Uh, by the way, the chip itself, the microcontroller, does have its own internal clock source if you want to use it. However, it's not very accurate, which means that it kind of drifts around. It speeds up a little bit, it slows down a little bit over time, and just it's not really guaranteed to be very accurate. It may be good enough for a lot of things, but there are times when a, a, when a more accurate clock source is helpful, especially if this chip, for example, is going to communicate with a... Um, 
with another computer. The, the timing of these pulses of communication needs to be a little better. So a higher quality clock source is required, and that's why you have this. Incidentally, this guy over here is a crystal, and that's another clock source for this chip, which we'll talk about in a second. But this is the most accurate clock source that you can get. And this, you can see, is number 16. This is 16 megahertz. That means 16 million clock pulses a second. And there's literally a little piece of quartz uh, chip or quartz crystal in there that's been cut in such a way so that when it vibrates naturally, it vibrates at 16 million uh, vibrations a second. And then there's wires connected to it to turn that into pulses and all that. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, that, this is a good clock source as a crystal. This is an oscillator, which is not quite as good, but good enough. All right, that's that. And here's the schematic again. Here's the power circuit uh, as from before. Now I've highlighted the clock part of it. Here's the crystal. That's the symbol for crystal, the square with a line on top and the bottom. And this is our AVR microcontroller, by the way. It says AT Mega 8. This is the thing that we'll be programming and so forth. Uh, okay. And I put another picture of a crystal on another circuit board. Okay, so the next part about the Arduino are these headers, uh, receptacles, whatever you want to call them. They're just places that you can stick a pin into or a wire into that will allow you to essentially, th these things are connected directly to the chip. So you're essentially connecting yourself directly to a pin of this microcontroller here. So the schematic part of that is pretty simple. Here I have highlighted them. And notice that uh, how they're connected. This pin here, uh, pin zero of IOL goes to PD0, and then pin one goes to PD1, and two goes to, it's, it's just a straight connection. You'll notice that some of these pins are shared. They go to other places as well. Um, I won't get into, the, uh, you'll notice these two pins at the bottom, which are transmit and receive. Uh, some of these pins on an AVR microcontroller can do more than just input output. They can be used to do other things if you want to. And in some some cases, this chip will use their pins for other purposes. This, so you know, is a programming port. This is how you get a program onto the chip when it's blank. And um, we'll talk more about that in a second. All right, the final part about this board I want to explain is the USB to serial. So this includes this square chip up here and its crystal and some lights. These are lights that turn on. Uh, this is... Well, let me think. I think the next slide. Here we go. Here's the schematic where I've highlighted everything. Here's that square chip. And here's the USB port. And and let's see what's... Yeah, okay. So an AVR microcontroller usually will require an external programmer of some kind. This is a circuit board that I have, a very poor quality picture of it that you attach to your computer. In fact, I think the next slide, yeah. So you attach it to your computer and then it in turn has four wires that come out of it that will hook onto four specific pins of the microcontroller. The, the clock, the MISO, which stands for master in, slave out, master out, slave in, and select. Those four pins are the typical way that you uh, get a program into this chip. And that works fine. That's how I used to do it, and I still do it that way. However, uh, that means you need to buy one of these programmers. I mean, they're like 100 bucks, or they're cheaper ones, but it's just an extra piece that you have to have around and that you might lose and all that. Wouldn't it be nice if you can somehow get the program into this chip without having to use uh, an extra programmer? Well, uh, the, the folks that make, made the Arduino thought that would be nice, so they came up with something clever. So in order to understand how it works, what they came up with, let's talk about something called a bootloader which then requires us to talk about the idea that there's a piece of storage in the microcontroller where you write your programs to. And our particular microcontroller can store 32,000 bytes, each byte being 8 bits, if you remember what a byte is. 32,000 bytes. So from 0 to 32, it's that big. So they actually can create a, they wrote a bootloader program. And the program is kind of stuck at the end. This is just a program was written in, on the computer, and then they flashed it, and they flashed it in such a way to the chip that it didn't start at zero, it started at 31 and a half. So it's half a K because it goes from 31 and a half to 32. And then this chip is programmed. There's some settings inside of it that you can get to that say, hey, listen, when you turn on, I want you to, instead of starting at zero and running whatever you see there, I want you to start at 31.5 first, and then this bootloader will tell you what to do. 
And so what will happen is the bootloader will actually see that when you turn it on, the bootloader will run automatically. It's just a program. And this program in here will look to see if there's anything here. If it's not, if there's nothing there, or, then it will actually say, wait a minute. Um, I need to go into a special mode where I listen for a program that you want to send me to write into here. And so the way it works is, do you remember these four pins were what, what the external programmer uses, the master in, slave out, master out, slave in, these special. Instead, what we do is we connect two more pins, uh, the receive and the transmit pin. And this is part of that serial port I showed in, the, in an earlier slide. A serial port being a very simple way to communicate bytes back and forth instead of a more complicated way that involves four lines. We just have two lines here. And uh, so all you have to do is run this, uh, these two wires to your serial port on your computer, and then the program on your computer can then send the data, the, the, the program that you want to flash into this chip, through the serial port, and the bootloader is listening on, on the receive pin here for bytes that are coming in as it gets them it writes it into flash so this your program is in orange let's say and this was brought in by the bootloader you communicated over the serial port that your your orange program and the bootloader takes that program and actually flashes the chip for you so now you can actually use serial communication which any computer knows how to do so that's great all you got to do is connect your chip you know, first of all, somehow get the bootloader on the chip. So that means someone else has to do that for you using the old way of these four lines. So when you buy your Arduino, someone has already put that bootloader into the chip for you. And now all you have to, because the bootloader is there and it knows how to speak serial port stuff, uh, it's ready to go. You just hook it to your computer. But the problem is, and here's a serial port on a computer. Unfortunately, as you can see from the title here, um, this doesn't really happen much anymore. Most computers these days do not come with serial ports. Those have just kind of gone away. Um, <clears throat> and instead, what you see nowadays are USB ports, right? Everyone knows about USB ports. They're everywhere. So unfortunately, that throws a wrench in our plans because USB is a very complicated protocol. I looked into it once. It is complicated. And you need a lot of special hardware and stuff to talk it and all this special timing. And it's just a pain. Serial port is easy. Anyone can learn serial port stuff in like an hour. USB would take you months to learn. Uh, so what do we do? How do we, how do we speak USB? Well, the answer is that the, uh, the chip that's on the, uh, let me back up. This chip here that's on the Arduino knows how to speak USB. So it has some wires attached to the USB port. And what happens is when you plug that Arduino into your computer uh, through the USB port, that little chip tells, actually talks to your computer and says, hey, what's up? I'm a USB device, and I am a, I, and I am a certain kind of special device called a, a virtual serial port. And what happens is your Windows or Mac, whatever, computer will install a driver automatically when you plug your Arduino in that creates a USB serial port. It's kind of like a pretend serial port that doesn't really exist except in software. And if I lose you here, please don't worry about it. This is not super important, but for those that are uh, tracking with me here and want to learn, just continue on. What happens is your computer actually has a USB driver now, and your program actually thinks that's using this whole system, that's programming your chip through a, it thinks it's talking through a serial port, but what's really happening is that serial port's talking to a USB driver, which sends the data out the port, across the cable to the Arduino, which goes into that chip that we were talking about, that turns it back into serial, and then that in turn goes to the AVR. So what, this is complicated, but what the end result is, is it looks to the program on your computer that it's talking through some serial port directly to your AVR. All this stuff up here, boils down to this. Uh, so your program thinks it's talking through COM3 directly to the AVR and back. So that's how, that's what's going on here. We actually have created a serial port through a USB chain of stuff uh, to allow simple communication uh, through it. All right, so there's the USB to serial again. Okay, um, and you know what? I'm gonna show the schematic. Do, 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 do. That's why this whole USB code, do you see, has two wires that come out of it 
that if, if go up to receive and transmit. So that's what's going on there. We're borrowing those two pins sometimes to actually talk to the bootloader in the chip and get the program through all this mess into your AVR. So that's what all this is about. All right, now I can fast forward. Finally, I think that's most of it. Uh, so here's the diagram of the Arduino. I've shown this in the class before, but here's the chip by itself with all its port pins, PC6, PD0, PD1. These are all sort of scrambled. Uh, they're not really, I mean, some of them are sort of in order. But what happens is the Arduino takes this chip and it runs wires from each one you know, on the circuit board so that we have PD0 right here on this pin and PD1 on this pin and all the way up to PD7. So you'll have all eight PD ports pins nice in a row ready for you to tap into same thing for port B it only has six of them zero through five that's all that this chip has it ran out of pins before it could go any higher and then you have PC zero through PC five <clears throat> okay um, one thing I wanted to point out do you notice this little light here this is a this is a light that's connected to looks like PB5 and let's go to the schematic I want to show that real quick uh, there you go. Do you see PB5 up here? This not only does PB5 go to a receptacle for you to touch or t uh, tap tap into, but it also goes through a light. So if you put five volts, if you turn on PB5, that'll actually turn this light on, which is kind of nice. That's uh, in our first program, we're going to turn this light on and off. That's connected to PB5, so that'll come up later. All right. So is that it? I believe we're there. Okay, so of course the Arduino, the whole point of it is to uh, build on top of it. So people have made all these different circuit boards that are called shields for whatever reason, and they all have these pins sticking down beneath them that allow you to essentially uh, connect this board to your Arduino, and essentially that means you've connected to the pins of, this, of your microcontroller. Uh, and you'll notice some of them ha continue with female headers up here, so you can actually stack. So maybe you only use three of the pins on this chip, on this shield. That means you still have some pins available to use for other shields to stack on top. Maybe you want to have an LCD screen on top. That only takes about four or five pins, so you can, you can stack them and configure them so they don't overlap. All right, so different shields. And uh, here's our microcontroller chip one more time. It, it uh, wants 5.5 volts to run at full speed. Uh, 32k of RAM, half uh, half a k is used by that bootloader program already. Uh, it's got some memory, it's got some EEPROM to write down things, and it runs at 16 megahertz. So that's what that oscillator uh, on it on the uh, on the board, the Arduino board runs at. Uh, so this runs at 16 million operations a second. Finally, Arduino comes with its own programming environment. I'm, I'm going to try not to use this at first because I think it makes it too easy. It hides too much from you about how the chip works. So we're going to try using a different environment that's a little more interesting. But uh, just so you know, you'll notice Arduino environments all over the place. All right, that's the end of my introduction to Arduino. Uh, the only takeaway that you really need to have on it is just to the understanding that the Arduino is a, uh, uh, a support system for this chip here. This is what we're going to be programming, and the Arduino makes sure that this chip has power and gives you a way to communicate to it, get the program onto it without needing an external programmer. All you need is a USB cord. Uh, so that makes it pretty simple. So that is the introduction, and we'll uh, hopefully be doing our first program soon on this Arduino. All right, thanks.